Good morning and good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar series for 2021 for Restore America's Estuaries. My name is Hillary Stevens. I'm the Coastal Resilience Manager here. We are very excited to start our webinar series for this year by welcoming Megan Barker from Trout Unlimited Alaska to be talking about their work on Bristol Bay uh, to protect it from the pebble mine development. We have a large number of attendees today, so everyone is uh, muted and in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the course of the talk, we ask that you put them in the question box, which should be on the right side of your screen. And uh, at the end of Megan's talk, I will take those questions and field them to her. Uh, we should have a few minutes at the end there to take questions, and we will be wrapping up right on time. This event is recorded and it will be posted within the next couple of days on our YouTube channel and on our website, which you'll see uh, in just a moment here. Again, my name is Hillary Stevens, and I work with Restore America's Estuaries. We are an organization based in Washington, D.C. We work with our member, alliance, our member organizations. We serve as an alliance for them, an advocate and a convener for people working in coastal areas throughout the nation. The map you'll see here uh, shows the locations of our 10 member organizations. As you see, they are located on the East Coast, Gulf Coast, and West Coast of the US. You will note we do not currently have any member organizations in Alaska. Um, we are therefore particularly excited to welcome a speaker today representing that region, um, as we would like to be reaching out and, and making sure that we are representing uh, our entire nation. Our, you'll see our website on the bottom of the page there if you're interested in finding any more information about our programs. Uh, our topic today is about Bristol Bay, Alaska. Um, we will be hearing about Trout Unlimited's uh, efforts to protect Bristol Bay fisheries. Uh, they use science and grassroots advocacy to um, prohibit the pebble mine development from getting its federal permits in 2020. Our guest speaker today is Megan Barker. She is the Bristol Bay organizer for Trout Unlimited. She's based in Anchorage, Alaska. Megan has worked to spread the word about the threat of pebble to anglers and fishing businesses in the lower 48 and will lead grassroots efforts for advancing long-term protection for Bristol Bay. When she's not working, Megan can be found fishing, running, or skiing in South Central Alaska. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you, Megan, for getting up. Uh, it is early and it is still dark there. Uh, so again, we, we thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and with that, I will hand this over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Hillary, uh, for that lovely introduction. Let's see, I'll get my presentation up real fast. Yep, okay. there you go. Thank okay, you so much. wonderful. Great. Well, again, thank you, Hillary, and um, the rest of the crew at Restore America's Estuaries for having me today. I'm really excited to be chatting with this group and sharing about the work that uh, I get to do and have the honor of working um, with the crew with Trout Unlimited up here. So um, like Hillary said, my name is Megan Barker. I'm the Bristol Bay organizer for Trout Unlimited based in Anchorage. Uh, I'm coming to you today from, from traditional Dena'ina homelands. Um, and I, I live and work in Anchorage. And um, I've got, I'm gonna try and keep what, what I have to share today to about 45 minutes, but it's a lot of content uh, and we'll leave time for questions like it was said, but uh, I plan on doing a little bit of an overview of, of why Bristol Bay and, and why this fishery is so important for so many people uh, and why we've been fighting so hard to protect it. I'm gonna share a little bit of background about Pebble just so we all have an understanding of, of what the threat was and what the threat could potentially still be. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the tactics that, that got us to a really massive conservation win um, this past year. And then I'll finish by sharing just some themes that I, that I found to be successful for us that um, might be helpful for, for you um, wherever you are working and on the conservation efforts that you care about. So with that, um, just to give a little bit of context, I know that, that a lot of folks are joining us from, from the East Coast, but Alaska might be a little bit out of your, of your viewpoint, and hopefully we have a couple folks on who have either been able to come visit or, or have some experience up here. But 
Just to give a little bit of background about Trout Unlimited uh, and what we do, we are a, a national nonprofit organization um, dedicated to the conservation of, of cold water fisheries nationwide. And so for the team that works up here in, based in Anchorage and Juneau, we work on protecting and conserving a couple of the, um, the, the biggies, we call them, the, the big fisheries that are, are incredibly important, um, not only in Alaska, but that have national importance. And, uh, like I said, our team in Anchorage and Juneau um, works on places um, like Bristol Bay. So the, the area that we are talking about that's subject today is located in uh, southwest Alaska. So uh, we're talking in the Bering Sea, just north of the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, and I'm going to be talking back and forth about the bay itself, but also the majority of the work that we do uh, is in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. So again, in in the uh, southwest region of Alaska uh, and situated uh, among a couple of different communities uh, that, that exist and have, have uh, lived there for, for many, many years. Just a little bit more background about me so you, you understand where I'm coming from and uh, how, I, how I made it to Trout Unlimited and this campaign. Uh, I'm originally from Colorado. I, I, came to Alaska for the first time during a summer in college. It was just supposed to be uh, a fun summer working in Glacier Bay National Park before I was gonna go work on, on the hill in DC. Um, but that summer was, was very transformative for me as it was as um, you know Alaska in the summer is for, for many people. And I very quickly realized that Alaska is where I wanted to call home. And so after I finished um, school, I came and worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Homer, which is at the end of the Kenai Peninsula in South Central Alaska, uh, doing uh, environmental education and outreach uh, for the, the National Wildlife Refuge there. And then I did that for about a year before I came to Trout Unlimited uh, in Anchorage, working specifically as the Bristol Bay organizer on this campaign. And so it's been a fast and furious two years. Um, working um, for this effort, but um, it's something that I'm, I'm really honored to do and uh, I'm really excited to share um, more about this place that means so much to me as well as so many of the people um, that I work with and, and have the honor of working with on a daily basis. So um, I wanna share a little bit and, and try and do my best to paint this picture of Bristol Bay. While I wish I could transport each and every one of our attendees there, uh, unfortunately I can't do that. Um, but I can share some incredible images that I think uh, just show how uh, unique and, and vast this place is. So when you see pictures like this on your screen, uh, you might think like, oh, that's photoshopped. Or like, there's no way that that many fish can exist in one place. And this is very much real. And this is very much what streams in Bristol Bay look like in the summer. So these streams, um, some of the most prolific sockeye salmon um, producing rivers, um, on the planet are, are in Bristol Bay and they are nestled between um, miles and miles and miles of untouched wilderness. And, and it is truly wilderness in that there are no roads, no buildings, no fences. Um, it, it's incredible. And, and these streams, they're, they're gin clear, minus the fact that they run red in, in the summertime with, with spawning um, salmon that have come upstream to complete their life cycle. And uh, again, just a place that doesn't exist anywhere else on, on the planet. Bristol Bay is, is home to lots of uh, charismatic megafauna. And so I recommend, while we, we don't have time in today's presentation, to watch all these videos. I, I highly recommend if you need a little pick-me-up or just want to get lost in, in some incredible scenery. Um, if you head to our website, we've got lots of videos from our partners that, that will help paint this picture a little bit more. But as even you can see in some of the thumbnails, uh, massive wildlife, uh, really incredible um, water resources, and and uh, a place that uh, is truly unique, not only to Alaska, but but to uh, our, our country and our planet. So while Bristol Bay is this incredible place, I want to zoom out just for, for a quick minute and, and put this in context uh, with the rest of the wild Pacific uh, salmon fishery and, and just to kind of hone in on the fact that Bristol Bay is unique and Bristol Bay is really um, the, the last salmon stronghold that we have. So what you see on this map on your screen is the historic salmon range for, for wild Pacific salmon. And in places that you might historically think of or, or that might spark your, your attention for places you might think of for salmon, places like Washington and Oregon, 
you see a lot of the color yellow, which is representative of low numbers and diversity of, of wild Pacific salmon. And every single one of those red dots that you see represents a hatchery. And so uh, as you move further, further north, um, you start to see a little bit more blue up in British Columbia into South Central, or excuse me, Southeast Alaska. As you move further north um, around South Central Alaska and around the Alaska Peninsula and you make your way into Bristol Bay, you see that dark swath of, of, of really dark blue, a representative of abundant salmon, diverse species, and you don't really see any of those red dots. You don't see any hatcheries. And so again, it just goes to show that, that Bristol Bay is really the last wild sockeye salmon uh, and, and wild salmon stronghold that we have left um, in, in this region and why, and that being said, it's so important that we protect it. A big component of, of and arguably the most, the only component of, of why Bristol Bay remains uh, as such a stronghold is because it still has intact headwaters. So it doesn't have development. It doesn't have uh, habitat um, degradation um, because of development um, in places um, that are needed to support um, massive runs of fish. And so that is, again, why Trout Unlimited and so many other organizations and people care so much about this, this resource is because it is really the last place that, that we have um, to see um, prolific salmon runs. But to, to give a little bit more uh, of numbers behind um, this incredible fishery, just to, to put some, some data behind it, in 2020, Bristol Bay had another um, massive sockeye run. 57.9 million fish flushed through uh, the region uh, this summer, and that was nearly 20% higher than uh, the preseason predictions. Um, again, it's important to consider that uh, this in relationship to the rest of Alaska's fisheries, many of them um, failed or were in decline this year, um, except for Bristol Bay. Bristol Bay continues to do, to do great. And so we want to try and make sure that that, that is um, continued because of um, all of the, the different reasons that um, the, the salmon contribute to the, the strong communities um, there. And also just, you know, to, to know and to be really clear, um, almost 50% of all of the sockeye salmon that is harvested across the country, or excuse me, across the globe, comes just from Bristol Bay. So um, Bristol Bay is producing um, food and, and resources for people uh, uh, across the planet. And while we really hone in on the sockeye salmon just because Bristol Bay is a sockeye salmon country, also it's important to know that the region is among one of the largest producers of king salmon globally. And uh, I'll let other people argue about um, what they prefer more, sockeye or, or king salmon, but still just uh, goes to show the uh, massive nature of this place and, and how many millions of fish um, this ecosystem is supporting. And again, while we, we hone in and we talk about the salmon just because um, that is, uh, you know, the most iconic component of, of Bristol Bay, the region is also, and the, the streams in the region are also chock full of other cold water fish species that are so important um, not only to the ecosystem but to um, many anglers that that common fish uh, for tr uh, trophy rainbow trout and arctic char and arctic grayling and dolly varden and the list goes on but really just goes to show that the clean water and, and healthy habitat of the region is what makes this such a mecca for for so many fish um, that being said, also, you know, going back to the salmon, they are the keystone species and they support everything from the tiniest microorganisms in the stream beds all the way up to the, the massive brown bear, which are almost more iconic, if not more iconic than uh, the, the salmon themselves. And while Bristol Bay really is an incredible ecosystem in itself, it is uh, absolutely critical that we talk about the different human communities that have built their, their lives and uh, their, their livelihoods around the, this resource. And so there are three um, different uh, human user groups that we talk about the most when we talk about Bristol Bay. Uh, and it's also important to note how these groups have come together um, for the conservation of this place. So um, the first group that I'll, I'll just talk about real quickly is um, the recreational anglers um, that have a huge stake in Bristol Bay. So this region is considered an angler's paradise, perhaps why Trout Unlimited and so many Trout Unlimited members are, are so invested in this region is because it sits atop the bucket list for so many people to come and visit, um, to fish for, for truly 
trophy trophy fish and um, there's over a 100 year history of, of people coming and fishing Bristol Bay waters. About 40,000 trips or, or fishing trips are taken every year uh, in the region with about 13,000 anglers coming from out of state. So contributing to a really robust economy in a non-COVID year. And that uh, recreational fishing economy amounts to about $160 million uh, annually uh, and provides over a thousand jobs uh, for people, whether that's um, working as a guide, as a lodge operator, as a pilot, the list goes on. So to hone in, Bristol Bay is a, is a sportsman's paradise, absolutely. Uh, the second uh, human community that we talk about that has absolutely um, built itself around the fishery is the Bristol Bay commercial fishery. And it is truly a powerhouse uh, with one point, it's a $1.5 billion economy um, supporting over 14,000 jobs. Again, everything from your fishermen to your tender operators, your cannery workers, your fish processors, the list goes on. And what I find really um, interesting about the commercial fishery in Bristol Bay is that it makes up 75% of the local employment, some of the small communities um, that are that are here. So um, in especially the hubs of Dillingham and King Salmon, um, it's not only important economically for these communities, but it's also very much a cultural uh, time, especially because for so the sockeye or the fishing season is so short. So in the spring, after all the ice is melted away and we start to have really long days, there's such a buzz uh, of communities that um, are gearing up to support um, a, a salmon and a fishing season. So again, really unique component that's very spe specific and special to Bristol Bay, but um, the co uh, commercial fishing uh, being a, a massive component of, of this region. And last but absolutely not least, um, the uh, the Alaska Native community um, is uh, primarily uh, or dependent on subsistence fishing. And so nearly 8,000 Alaska Native people of Yupik, Alutic, and Athabascan cultures um, have been living and, and hunting and fishing in this region for thousands of years. And we are absolutely grateful for their continued stewardship of, of this place and of the resources in this region. But um, very interesting and, and important to point out that um, because of the uh, heavy influence of, the, of subsistence um, hunting and fishing, when we talk about any changes to the fishery, we have to consider that this is also a food security issue for, for thousands of people. And so when uh, these communities are, are har harvesting 2.4 million pounds of salmon, and 50% of their protein intake every year comes from salmon, um, we have to make sure we are considering that in, in our conversation about the fishery as a whole. And I will also just add in this conversation about subsistence is that Bristol Bay, um, it's off the road system. So the only way that you can get there is through, or is on an airplane or on a boat. And that being said, um, grocery stores and, and getting groceries are, is. Is really challenging and if you do it um, in some of these communities if they have a grocery store um, it's very expensive and so it is very safe to say that what uh, families are harvesting and, and hunting and fishing for uh, during the year is what will feed them um, for the, throughout the seasons and so again it's just I just want to hone in on the fact that this is absolutely uh, a, a social issue as well and the, the fishery has been something that has sustained um, indigenous cultures for, for thousands of years. And so um, despite having the, the, these inc this incredible ecosystem that has brought these different communities um, together and that have lived in harmony relatively for, for so many years, um, there has been a proposal that threatens um, all of this uh, for nearly the last 20 years, and that's the proposed pebble mine. So, for those who are unfamiliar with Pebble, my you know one sentence shtick about what Pebble is is that it's the proposal to or it was the proposal to build the uh, largest open pit copper and gold mine that would have been in North America, right in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. So, um, Pebble, uh, the Pebble deposit is a low grade deposit of copper and gold and molybdenum and a couple other trace elements. Um, that was discovered in the late 1980s and um, the the mineral deposits that um, or the land that the mineral deposits are on are owned by the state of Alaska and um, 
uh, a Canadian mining company currently has them, has the, the mineral leases to um, this whole region. Um, that company is Northern Dynasty Minerals. They're based in Vancouver, BC. Uh, and for the last 20 years, they have been making a very, very hard push effort to develop um, the pebble deposit and extract uh, the ore that is worth about $600 billion. So quite a, a, a large financial stake in, in developing this region. Um, also, just a couple other stats about Pebble as it was proposed um, in the most recent uh, proposal, it was said to be a, a mine plan that would have about a 25 year lifespan and it would, would have been a mine that uh, would have produced about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 jobs again over the course of that 25 year lifespan. Let's see. So I'm not going to go in too deep um, of talking about the details, but I do just want to share something that's uh, I think really important and really uh, unique to this proposal in this place. Uh, so again, a lot of people were just really concerned right at the start of this mine. It's digging, uh, it would have been digging a one mile wide by a quarter mile deep open pit uh, about 20 miles north of Lake Iliamna, again in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. And while the mine itself is, is uh, incredibly disturbing and, and would have had a massive impact um, in the wetlands of the area, but also in the surrounding habitat. Um, again, Bristol Bay is largely undeveloped. They don't have the, it doesn't have the infrastructure to support industrial mining in the region. And so Pebble, as it had been proposed, would have also needed to build a series of uh, pretty large infrastructure projects, including a ice-breaking ferry that would have crossed Lake Iliamna multiple times a day, uh, a 90 mile uh, road corridor that would have um, run adjacent to the McNeil River uh, State Game Refuge and Game Sanctuary, which is the highest concentration of brown bears on the planet. Um, they would have had to build, uh, build a deep water port at Amatadori uh, Creek in Kamashak Bay. And then Pebble had also proposed building a 200 mile uh, long natural gas pipeline, which would have transported energy from the Kenai Peninsula to the mine site. So. While we are very much concerned with the mine, the mine itself would have had massive impacts to salmon um, and all of the other resources, the natural resources resources in the region. The other components of infrastructure that would have need to be built in order to make Pebble functional also carried a significant amount of concern for uh, recreational anglers who, who come and fish this place. Um, subsistence users as well as commercial fishermen um, who fish not only in Bristol Bay but in the Cook Inlet uh, and, and in Kamashak Bay. So with all of that just kind of narrowing it down to some of our most our biggest concerns the biggest concerns of this coalition of, of, of tribes of commercial fishermen and of recreational fishermen that came together put some differences aside to come together we were primarily concerned about the size of the mine so again you have to remember that that this would have been the largest open pit mine in North America, right in the headwaters of the most prolific sockeye salmon fishery on the planet. And so those two um, were, were incompatible. And I'll talk in a second about how those were incompatible um, based on science. And uh, our second biggest concern was the scope of the mine and the potential for this region to turn into an industrial mining complex, which is something that uh, we are definitely still watching and what we are still concerned about. So. Based on this map that I have, um, what's yellow represented what was the proposed pebble mine, so what we just um, were, were fighting, um, but everything in red around it represents all of the mineral claims that pebble has. And so we knew that pebble had put forward and was trying to get the permits for this initial mine plan, knowing that the second that they did that, built all of the additional infrastructure, um, it would make it a lot easier for them to expand their operation and turn Bristol, the headwaters of Bristol Bay in into, into an industrial mining district. So again, being able to read that and to see that, um, knowing that that was coming was a big concern and a big reason why so many people have said no to, to this initial mine. And a final just thing to consider that we were very concerned about that as an Alaskan, I am very concerned about is just the geophysical location of this region. So uh, if you're if you're unfamiliar with Alaska, we we sit on the ring of fire and have earthquakes frequently. Like I was woken up in my sleep a couple of nights ago because we had an earthquake. Like it happens a lot, um, and especially in Bristol Bay, uh, the mine site, especially the 
um, the pit itself and the earthen dam that would have contained um, billions of tons of, of waste rock and, and wastewater from the mine. Um, it ran less than 10 miles away from the Lake Clark Fault. So again, putting a very risky project in, a, in probably the, the worst possible place for this kind of mine um, based on the geophysical location of it. And when we talk about you know, these groups that have, have fought this proposal uh, from, from the beginning, I wanna be clear that um, this, this effort to stop Pebble started um, with the local people in Bristol Bay. And it started very much with um, you know, 20 years ago when Pebble was digging around, they were, or when they were exploring their options, they were going to different communities and they were talking about this promise of a mega mine and it was gonna produce tons of jobs. And uh, a lot of communities were, were on board and they were interested because of the, the needs, the economic needs of the community. But when you pull back the layers, you start to understand just how big this mine was gonna be. Uh, it became uh, much more apparent that this was going to be a mine that wouldn't be in the best interest of the local communities as well as the other industries that are built around and based um, on the salmon. And so again, if you take nothing else from this presentation, I wanna be really clear that, that this effort started with local people, it started with these local villages and, and uh, Alaska Native people who have stood up and, and fought for um, their cultures, for their jobs that they already have and, and have led this effort with uh, recreational fishermen and commercial fishermen to be this really united front that has been strong and has been um, probably the, the biggest component of the opposition to Pebble that, that they have been un they were unable to, to overcome. Let's see, and again, just to put this in a little bit greater context and to, to help understand just the level of opposition um, statewide. So uh, where polling has sat for the last 15 years or so, uh, Alaskans have been overwhelmingly opposed to Pebble. I, I would even, I think it's fair to say that Alaskans hate Pebble. Um, for a state that is, you know, built off natural um, natural resource uh, extraction industry, um, opposition to the pebble mine specifically statewide has sat around 60% consistently. And when you go into the Bristol Bay region, the polling in those communities, that opposition sits at about 80% opposed. So, and and that's been consistent over time. So again, when you look at a state that um, doesn't have a problem normally with with uh, uh, extracting natural resources. When it came to Pebble, people uh, saw the writing on the wall and they knew that uh, fish were fish are uh, the resource that will continue um, if we basically leave things as they are. So I'm gonna um, transition now and talk a little bit about the timeline of the Pebble mine battle, just to help us understand how we got to um, some of the biggest conservation wins of, of 2020. Um, but unfortunately, I have to, to go back and, and share some of that, that history. So bear with me, we'll, we'll go through this quickly. So um, I talked about this coalition of, of, of tribes, commercial fishermen, and recreational anglers. We all came together in 2010 after Pebble had been sniffing around, been talking about this plan for a mega mine. And we wanted to know exactly what would the impact of a mine like this be on the Bristol Bay fisheries. So we called in the EPA to conduct a Clean Water Act assessment. And they came in over three years and, and conducted significant um, scientific study uh, and also uh, um, uh, held lots of public hearings and took pu public testimony. Uh, and they, in 2013, completed the what we lovingly call um, the world's biggest book report on Bristol Bay or the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment. And in that watershed assessment, there were over a million comments that were submitted, um, not only by people in Bristol Bay, but of people from across the country who know um, the value of, uh, of the region and of the fishery. And um, in that Bristol Bay, uh, excuse me, in that Bristol Bay watershed assessment, the, the biggest conclusion was that um, based on the science, any open pit mine uh, of this scale, of this size in this region would have a negative impact on the fishery. And so um, after that was a, a pretty uh, harsh conclusion for for Pebble and for other companies that you know had their eye on on developing the deposit. And so pretty quickly after that, Pebble lost a couple of key investors. So Anglo American pulled out of their partnership. Uh, they were followed by Rio Tinto, 
2010, um, that was bookended by the EPA releasing the, it's called the Proposed Determination for Bristol Bay or the PD. And the PD basically, uh, it put forward protections for the region that would have scaled down mining to be so small that it would have an acceptable amount of impact on the fishery. But in doing that, it makes any kind of mining project pretty economically infeasible. Um, and so with that, that was a way that they, they used the Clean Water Act um, based on the science of the watershed assessment uh, to put up some protections for Bristol Bay. And in um, the wake of the, releasing the proposed determination, over one and a half million uh, Americans weighed in again to say that they supported the proposed determination and that they did not want uh, a mine that would impact the fishery um, that was being talked about with Pebble uh, to be to be allowed. And so at that point, we saw Pebble get really quiet. They didn't go away altogether, but they were certainly not in a place uh, where where they were going to be able to move forward. Uh, after they had lost investors, they weren't in a good political um, environment uh, with the Obama administration. And so um, they kind of, like I said, they just got quiet. However, um, with the change of the administration, um, they got some new life breathed into their project. And so um, with the um, coming in of, of the Trump administration in 2016 and 2017, um, in uh, later in 2017, Pebble filed for their key federal permit. This is the first time in this entire 20 year long battle that we saw Pebble take actual steps to move forward and acquire the things that they need to have a shovel or the tools you need for industrial mining in the ground in Bristol Bay. And so um, filing for that permit was, was a big um, eye opening of, oh, they're going to try and make a, a run for this and try and, and make this happen. And so filing for that permit kicked off a, a, a permitting review process that was carried out by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and so in 2018, the first step of that uh, of, of that project was, um, excuse me, I got my screens got a little bit messed up. Okay, the, the first part of that, that uh, permit review process was uh, going through scoping. So they went to a bunch of uh, Bristol Bay communities and they said, what do you want us to consider when we review this permit? And people across Bristol Bay communities uh, in uh, public testimony share, as well as 400,000 comments that were submitted by Alaskans and people uh, nationwide, they said, we do not want uh, you to even consider this mine at all. We do not want Pebble uh, built in, in Bristol Bay. Nonetheless, they continued. And so in January of 2019, the Army Corps of Engineers released the draft environmental impact statement. And uh, that draft environmental impact statement came with the, the final public comment period um, in which uh, Trout Unlimited, as well as all of our partners that, that work on this effort, we were able to rally over 685 thousand comments to be submitted. Again, that overwhelmingly said Pebble is unwanted in Bristol Bay. And also um, the draft environmental impact statement that was that was released was overwhelmingly lacking. It was um, not doing its job in fully encapsulating all of the potential risks that could come from a project like this. And, and that was significant because the final environmental impact statement is what Army Corps of Engineers would use to issue a decision on if Pebble is going to get their most important federal permit or if it's going to be denied. So basically, a lot of people weighed in, again, to say that this is a project that we do not uh, want and that is not supported um, by science because it's incompatible with the Bristol Bay fishery. So after we had this comment period, based on what we were looking at, you know, we, we kind of saw the writing on the wall and we figured we were pretty confident that um, the administration and the, the Army Corps of Engineers was going to grant Pebble this, this key federal permit. And we, uh, again, we felt confident that based on the science and based on the Clean Water Act, we'd be able to defend Bristol Bay in court after a permit uh, were to be issued. However, um, it's not, Trout Unlimited is not a, a fairly litigious organization, and we still felt like we had, you know, one last uh, avenue to try and land some protection for Bristol Bay and to stop this permit from being granted. And so uh, in early 2020, Trout Unlimited decided that we were going to petition uh, the Trump administration specifically and, and ask them to deny the permit. And this decision was made on a couple of different factors, but Largely, we knew that with this administration, 
when it comes to conservation, they listen to moderate and conservative sportsmen and women. And luckily, Trout Unlimited has a, a pretty strong history of, of uh, rallying moderate and conservative uh, anglers. And so um, through that, we um, made a, a hard push to um, raise this as an issue of national importance once again to the president and, and do all that we could to try and have uh, him instruct the Army Corps of Engineers to deny the permit. So early last year, in the spring of last year, we embarked on a couple of different strategies. Uh, and I shared this just from, from tactical of, of some of the things that we did to, to convey this. So uh, we delivered a letter from over 250 hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation businesses and groups, uh, which was a huge lift. And then we also were able to deliver that letter uh, with a petition signed by over 30,000 anglers, excuse me, hunters and anglers, um, directly to the White House. And, and that request was very simple. And it was, it was just to please deny Pebbles permit. And uh, I think, and I'll, I talk about it, I will talk about it a couple of different times, but having a huge show of support from our business community um, what was absolutely instrumental. And also um, we were able to blow our goals out of the water um, in terms of how many petition signers we were expecting. So you can see on the, the chart in the bottom, um, we were able to digitally organize um, thousands of people through various um, methods. We were, we were really concerned at the height of COVID that you know, we, we didn't have our in-person methods of, of getting of petition signers. We, we couldn't interact with people in person, but we poured a lot of resources into digitally organizing. And one of our social media days of action, as you can see in May, we were able to get 18,000 signatures in less than 36 hours, which uh, was huge and, and just went to show how, um, how important digital organizing was to our effort this year. But nonetheless, we were able to deliver that to the White House and, and we were able to kind of create our own news around uh, this massive show of opposition that was directed from a, a key constituency group to uh, the White House. And that was picked up. And so what many people saw um, later in August was that we got some high profile elevation from uh, some key conservative figures. So Nick Ayers is the former chief of staff for Vice President Pence. Uh, he tweeted his opposition to to the mine as and then it was followed by Donald Trump Jr. And um, that fight literally set off a firestorm uh, that was huge. Again, in, in re-elevating this, we got a lot of um, national press, uh, again, just, just elevating the issue and saying that this was a decision that was going to be coming down any minute uh, from, from the Army Corps of Engineers and that we, it was all hands on deck to stop it. And a lot of people look at this and they say, uh, you know, the outcome you got from the Pebble permit only came because these high profile people uh, tweeted and, and, you know, were, were outspoken on, on social media. And I think that it's really important to, to recognize and acknowledge the power behind that, but also know that these, these people would not have done this if we, they didn't have um, science to back them up, if uh, the, the effort to stop Pebble wasn't uh, legally sound behind the Clean Water Act and NEPA, and also if they didn't have the power of the sporting community behind them to, to back them up and, and to say, um, yeah, we are, we're calling for the same thing. So I, I do think that it's important that we had high profile figures speak up, absolutely. But I, I think that so much of that was made possible because of everyday sportsmen and women and people who've been working on this fight for so long who have repeatedly laid the foundation for, for these high profile folks to be able to speak out. And then as I'm just kind of sharing some of the other things that happened this summer, the, the ball just was totally rolling and, and we continued to have some, some more high profile uh, figures speak out. And so Tucker Carlson, who's a, a Fox News commentator, uh, he invited us to, to come on the show. And so we were able to um, very easily deliver Johnny Morris, who's the CEO of Bass Pro Shops. Um, he went on the first segment and he talked about Bristol Bay and the, the Bristol Bay fishery as a place um, that hunters and anglers, no matter your political background, can, can get behind. And, you know, just some of the language was really interesting how they taught how uh, a news platform that is um, typically not super friendly to environmental issues, how they framed a conservation issue versus a climate issue. And uh, we learned a lot from just some of the, the messaging that came from this being talked about by uh, kind of an, a non-traditional community. And then 
later, a, a couple weeks later, Tucker Carlson also had on Brian Kraft, who's a local lodge owner. Uh, and again, we were able to uh, make that case clear and then uh, also elevate it uh, across our channels to bring in more people who um, maybe wouldn't have come to our to our effort um, if based on their own political um, leanings. Um, just because we were able to frame it in a way that was more palatable for for moderate and conservative um, people who who care about some places they hunt and fish. And I just want to be conscious of time. Just a few things I'll also note. You know, I can't take any credit for this one, but it certainly is very interesting and was a, a huge um, component of of our effort. Uh, the pebble tapes. If you have time, certainly Google them. Um, the Environmental Investigation Agency, they are an, a DC-based nonprofit. Their investigators went undercover, posed as potential investors in the project, and got uh, the Pebble CEO, as well as their parent company, the Northern Dynasty Minerals, they caught their CEO on camera saying some absolutely damning things, uh, talking about um, how this mine was uh, you know, significantly, the mine that they had that put forward to federal regulators and the public was significantly smaller than what they were actually intending to build. They bragged about their political relationships that they've leveraged to move this mine forward. There are a lot of different components that were uncovered in the Pebble tapes, but it resulted in Pebble CEO um, resigning uh, right before a permit decision is supposed to be made. And, and then it also was kind of the final straw that pushed um, both Alaska's Republican senators, both Lisa Murkowski and Dan Sullivan, to publicly oppose the mine, which was absolutely massive and something that we have been working towards for for a very long time since they've consistently stood on this the sidelines and and refused to to take a stance. So that was huge in, in getting their support and, and making it clear that, uh, again, more conservative conservatives and Republicans are also opposed to to this mine. And so, uh, this all culminated, um, you know, despite all the politics that were flying uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, officially uh, denied the, the permit for the proposed pebble mine. And uh, this came down the day before Thanksgiving. It was gave us something to be so grateful for. But, you know, when you dig into the record of decision and the, the rationale that the Army Corps of Engineers gives for why they denied it, they didn't cite any of the the political things that had been going on. And while we know those things did play play a role, um, we know that bottom line, Pebble was incompatible with the Clean Water Act standards. And they did the Army Corps did note that it went the project went against public interest. And so from that, we we go back to science, um, the the legality uh, and the the coordination um, and I guess like the how how well the 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 mines um, stood up um, in reference with conservation laws that we have in this country, as well as all of the public opposition that has been documented over a very long time, um, was all taken into account um, when this permit was denied. So again, coming back to the fact that that science and and people speaking out time and time again was the reason that that this permit was was denied, and so. Um, that again, that happened in November. We we took our victory lap, and and now we are, um, you know, trying to figure out what next steps look like. And I was asked to provide some some takeaways of uh, exactly, you know, how could you potentially replicate this this big win, this conservation win, um, in you know times when uh, when in political times when. Uh, environmental efforts and, and conservation is really hard. Um, I'll just be really honest that. Uh, it's been really hard for us to replicate uh, even what we've done in Bristol Bay, not only within Trout Unlimited campaigns, but even within uh, campaigns that we work, work on in Alaska. So Bristol Bay is very unique based on the resource, based on um, the political um, standings, um, based on the public opposition, based on the fact that it's known globally as, as, a, as a massive um, place for, for the fishery. And so, um, while it's really hard, I think, to replicate that in other places, uh, just some of the takeaways that that I found that I do think that might be helpful for for you on based on where you work and uh, some of the different issues that um, that you are pushing forward on. Um, number one, science and policy has to be the foundation. So none of the work that we had done, none of the organizing 
Um, none of the um, you know, strategy would have worked if we didn't have a strong foundation of science and, and legal backing to um, support the fact that Pebble was the wrong mine for the wrong place. Uh, another thing that I, I take away a lot as an organizer, uh, especially this year, was to lean on business partners and, and your business networks. I think a lot of businesses, uh, especially this year, are really interested in, in supporting uh, 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 philanthropic efforts and, and conservation efforts, especially if that's um, a, a component of their business and, um, you know, making sure that those relationships and connections are clear are were, were something that we, it was really easy for us to call on our supporters um, at that point and you know we we used our business supporters and everything from signing on to letters to um, sharing social media posts and and sending emails to their massive list to sign petitions and that was absolutely crucial in in the organizing work that that went on this year and then uh, another organizing um, component that I just share um, and that I think was so important, especially during uh, our, our pandemic year um, was social media. And, you know, like I said, we were really struggling at the beginning of like, how do we, you know, bring all of these, this huge community into a place where we can accomplish what we need to accomplish when we can't see them in person and, and go to sports shows and go to events and, and do all these things, but we were able to really pour a lot of resources into social media organizing, and that ended up um, being able to cultivate a community that is charged and ready to go for the next thing that we will ask them to do. And so I will say that social, you know, investing in social media it, it takes a lot of work and it and it takes um, a lot of effort, but it certainly has been absolutely instrumental and something that I, I highly recommend that that um, folks um, look at growing. And then just a little bit specifically uh, for, for Bristol Bay, um, people ask what, what's next? We're gonna work actively to defend the permit decision. Again, we feel pretty confident in the grounds that the, the permit was denied um, based on the fact of its incompatibility with the Clean Water Act, but we already know that, that Pebble and the state of Alaska are planning on appealing the permit decision. And so we're gonna just watch that and make sure that uh, it continues to be upheld. Uh, and then, Meanwhile, we're also gonna work on advancing permanent protections in the region so that we do not have to fight Pebble or any other kind of mining project uh, in five years, in 10 years, in 50 years. And that will uh, look like working with Congress as well as the new administration uh, to uh, getting some long-term permanent protections in place that are supported um, first and foremost by the local community. So, that's a, a really big overview of, of what I have to share. And uh, I hope that I was able to communicate just um, you know, how important the Bristol Bay fishery is, but also um, how important science and, and grassroots advocacy are in making sure that we protect these special places. Uh, I highly encourage folks to, to head to our website, savebristolbay.org. There's a lot more information that I wasn't able to, to share today, but also get some inspiration and, and just check out why Bristol Bay is such a special place. And um, we've got some time for questions. I've got about 10 minutes, it looks like, uh, but I am always, my digital door is always open. So if folks have questions or, or wanna brainstorm um, different ways as far as organizing, I'm always interested to see what other people are working on and happy to, to share some help. So um, that being said, I think Hillary is gonna open us up for some questions if folks have them um, but yes, yeah thank you for there. listening thank you so much megan that was fantastic and yes the questions are coming right in so i'm going to dive right into it um okay. first one people may look at the commercial fishing industry with some skepticism could you touch on how the harvest of salmon differs from people's general understanding of unsustainable fishing practices Sure, I can talk about this a little bit, but I'll just be super um, upfront that my background is definitely more with the recreational fish fishery, but um, Alaska's commercial fisheries are some of the um, best managed fisheries, um, arguably on uh, on the planet. Um, there's a big, um, there's a lot of very strict rules that have to be followed um, and that they change daily um, with how the fishery is doing. So they have a huge, crew of biologists who are out monitoring fish levels um, like throughout the fishing season and, and then also very strong enforcement um, of those. So um, can I say exactly like 
how that functions, no, but I will say that the Bristol Bay commercial fishery has been managed very tightly and will continue that way. And people know, like commercial fishermen know that the only way that they can continue to come back and have massive hauls for the year is that if they follow these rules. So um, I definitely think it's like a unique cultural component of the Bristol Bay or the Alaska commercial fisheries, but I think also across the board, this is just um, how um, Alaska has set up um, fisheries to be to be managed and their success in that. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Why do you, this is very specific. Why do you think the opposition to the Ambler Road project, which would bisect gates of the Arctic National Park and threaten arguably the world's best sport fishery and subsistence fisheries has not gotten similar traction to the Pebble Mine opposition? Uh, the, the project and the mining complex will sprout from is on par with the pebble in terms of potential harm. Does it boil down to opposition not having allies in the commercial and recreational fishing? Um, do you have any comment on that? Um, again, I'll, I'll be honest, like I work primarily on Bristol Bay and Trout Unlimited hasn't weighed in on Ambler Road, though I know a little bit about it personally. Um, I think a, a lot of people just ask this question of, um, you know, why have, and it goes back to what I said about like, we haven't been able to replicate the successes for Bristol Bay, even across our Alaska campaigns. Like a lot of people ask, how has this not worked for the roadless rule in the Tongass National Forest or Anwar um, up in, uh, on the North Slope? I mean, um, these places all have very different um, social and economic um, situations. And I know that, I mean, Bristol Bay has, because it is such a sought after place, um, for recreational fishing, it certainly has garnered the attention of um, of the the sporting community in a way that like you know that that doesn't exist in in the Arctic. There isn't a huge tourism draw there um, like there is in other places. And so uh, with Ambler, I know specifically like that region is uh, I don't believe that it's a it's a high profile fishing destination. And so I think it's also just um, it, it carries a different set of um, state and federal politics as well that uh, differ significantly from Bristol Bay. So sorry, that's not a super great answer to that question, but it just goes back to every every place is different. Well, and it sounds like Bristol Bay is a really unique combination if it's a roadless area of being just accessible enough. Um, I mean, getting up to the North Slope is is nearly impossible for most people. To say that Bristol Bay is, does not have road access such that, that they would have to be building all of this access to get there, but yet is accessible enough that recreational fishers can get there. Yeah, I think accessible enough is, is again, very relative and very different for a location. Because I mean, Southeast Alaska is very much the same. I mean, our state capital is off the road system too. So you can't get there besides a, a plane or a boat. And even some of the, the North Slope community, most of the North Slope communities are off the road system too. So again, that's just a very unique Alaska component that um, makes things challenging, but is also just a, a component of, of life here and is, is pretty normal. Okay, we've got time for a couple of more here. Um, and Kevin writes, as someone who is employed in Bristol Bay during the summer months, I find it difficult to convey how special this place is to people who do not hunt or fish. Do you have any tips for references to reach these other folks? How can I be a better advocate being in Illinois where many people have not gotten to experience this incredible place? Um, that's a great question, Kevin. Thank you for, for asking. Um, obviously, like I struggle with it too because when you go out there, you have an experience that you're just like, you can't replicate it. Like you can't, it, it truly like takes the, the words out of your mouth. That's why I always try and and show, not tell. That's why I think videos are great, um, though they don't always capture that that Bristol Bay magic. Um, I highly recommend just getting in touch with our our campaign and um, especially connecting with us on social media. That's where we share a lot of um, really great images um, that have kind of helped un help under excuse me photos and videos that have helped paint this picture of what Bristol Bay looks like while also giving very um, concrete things that we've been asking people to do. So for example, on Friday afternoon, the governor announced that the state of Alaska would be appealing the permit decision. Um, we whipped out a script and put it on our Instagram stories. 
um, and then have also sent out, um, or we are about to send out an email with the same thing, and we've sent tons of people to go call the governor's office. So we're pretty good about making sure that that you have the tools that you need to um, be an advocate in the places where we need help. That's um, our job as campaign staff to help help you help Bristol Bay. So actually, people are asking uh, that they saw the governor's announcement and what can we do to counter this? Are there organized petitions or events? And it sounds like plug it into your social media is the place to find out about that effort. Yeah, so there isn't a place with this appeal that we can, um, you know, we can't intervene yet. Uh, if if we are going to, it would late, it would come later down the road. But again, our legal team is watching it, and we feel pretty confident that an appeal isn't going to go anywhere, and that this permit decision is going to be upheld. So the best thing that you can do, especially if you're an Alaskan, is to to call the governor and just remind him who he represents, and to stop doing the work of a uh, of the foreign mining company. That's um, you know, in the past, basically, in our eyes, and um, uh, that's the best way that you can help right now, and then stay tuned, because our work um, with advancing permanent protections, especially in Congress, it's going to, um, in the next couple months, it's going to start to take off, and it's going to be all hands on deck again, so we'll need your help there. Okay. Uh, and one last question. Uh, someone writes in, wonderful, thanks. I'm a resident and I've called. Awesome, um, perfect, thank you. Well, we got two minutes left, so here's the last question. Okay. What are the tactics and timeline to get the EPA to veto Pebble Mine and other potential mine projects so Bristol Bay is permanently protected? Yeah, so um, veto or the, you know, the effort to veto Pebble Mine, so the EPA to use their authority under the Clean Water Act um, to basically prohibit mining um, in the region. Um, it's something that some of our partners with some of our uh, partner coalitions have been working on um, a lot of this year while we were doing, uh, you know, we all work towards the same end goal, but sometimes we, we kind of, we, um, delegate and, and work on a couple of different things. So, so we have some really great partners who have been leading the effort for veto. Though um, with Trout Unlimited specifically, so we are actually still in litigation against the EPA. Um, this is getting real nitty gritty, but uh, uh, in 2019, we announced that we would be um, suing them for the fact that they were going to withdraw the proposed determination. And um, again, the, the steps that would lead us to a, a Clean Water Act um, veto per se and so we're still waiting for an outcome of that litigation but if we prevail and if um the court basically like reinstates the proposed determination um we will kind of have a head start and a, a jump um to be able to move forward with pursuing um clean water act protections with the epa um however we're gonna have to we, we're gonna have to wait until the biden administration comes in they have committed to um stop you know making sure that pebble doesn't go through but we need to make sure we bring them up to speed and um try and make sure that we're keeping it at the forefront of their mind so i would say um definitely 2021 is going to be a massive year as we we pursue these protections but know that um using clean water act with the epa is going to be one of a couple other tactics that we're going to be using um to per to pursue permanent protection for the region that's great. Thank you so much. Megan, I very much appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, this has been a, a fascinating topic and, and inspiring to hear for your, of your successes. So um, to our audience, again, um, if you know of anyone who was not able to attend this event, it was recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel and to our website. Uh, if you have any questions or any follow-up, feel free to get in touch with me or with Megan. You see her contact info. Um, if you have any topics that you'd like to hear more about, please feel free to let me know. We're always looking for new speakers. Um, and with that, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. It looks like the sun is up there, so uh, go poke yourself outside and enjoy it. I will. Thank you all so much. Have a good one. Thank you.